Ми ще тут люди з різних країн, і мене пару людей просило, щоб офлайн-запис потім подивитися. Тому я буду доповідати на англійській, ви можете задавати потім питання на будь-який, окей? Ну, якщо хтось не розуміє англійську, пока. Ну, no, sorry. Окей, okay, hello everybody. Uh, my name is Ingo Stepanian. I work as JavaScript performance engineer at Cloudflare. Uh, has anyone heard about Cloudflare? Okay. Oh, hello, Marty. Uh, so, um, as a JavaScript performance engineer, I mean, it's just a title, as all the titles here. But anyway, we uh, uh, need to often dig deeply into like why our applications are slow, um, why our code is slow, and so on. And latest thing that I was digging into was where JavaScript engines. That's why I'm going to talk about them. So this part will be mostly about theory, and we will be talking about VMs, IRS, TCFG, SSA, VDG, CPS, DC, LACM, GCM, GVN, JSC, DFG, FTL, VM. Do we have any more time? <laughs> okay, uh, or just shortly intro to the optimizing compilers, and we will be mostly talking about how uh, optimizing part of the modern JavaScript engines, not interpreter part, works internally. So, uh, first of all, why is JavaScript slow at all? Or at least why it was a couple of years ago. Uh, let's consider a simple function. We have just function add, which takes two arguments and returns a plus b. Very simple, not what we write in our applications, especially considering all the framework code. What exactly is happening? Let's take a look at what specification says about this. So we have this editor expression with some left, right side, right? And specification says how to evaluate such patterns. We have 13 steps that engine needs to go through to be like compliant and to correctly evaluate it. And among the steps, we need to get value of both references. We need to convert them to primitives using and other functions to primitive. Then we check types. If type of either of them is string, we call to string and return concatenation. Otherwise, we perform this two number and return just mathematical sum, right? Because plus in JavaScript can do different things depending on the types of arguments. Let's take a look at the highlighted parts, other functions that we are calling. Let's go into two primitive. Well, two primitive. Like for undefined, null, boolean, number, string, symbol, it's pretty simple. They're already primitive, so it just returns the input. But for objects, if you are passing objects uh, into the function, this special internal function, uh, then we have perform the steps following this table. And the steps are, when type is object, we choose preferred types, we call get method with symbol to primitive, then we check if it was not undefined, then we call another, then we call that method that we got from symbol to primitive, uh, otherwise we call ordinary to primitive. Then ordinary to primitive internally, uh, Use this method names depending on the hint, like is it to string and value of uh, or in different order, and calls them one by one. If any of this method exists, then it returns its value. You remember when we, where we started, right? So uh, let's go into the second function to string. What is to string doing? Well, for undefined, we just return string undefined. For null, we return string null. For boolean. That's pretty clear. For number, it says C section 71121. You don't want to see it, uh, really. For string, it just returns argument because it's already string. And for symbol, we throw type error exception. One type that is still missing here is object. When it's object, we call, again, to primitive. And from the to primitive, we call to string on top of that to primitive result. Another thing that we had in our in the original to primitive was, sorry, to number. For to number, we return none for undefined, plus zero for null, blah, blah, blah. For string, it says C grammar and conversion algorithm below. Again, you really don't want to see it. It's just huge, like three page of how number should be transformed to strings in different uh, bases. And for symbol, it's rotate our exception. Again, the fun missing part is objects. For objects, we call to primitive, and on top of that to primitive result, we call to number. This is just a lot of mess. Let me just use visualization so that you could understand what's happening when we just call A plus B. Note that 
we are not doing anything complex here. We're not calling any method, nothing. Just A plus B. We have all this mess. Oh, right, and I didn't show what the get method does internally. Let me expand it a little bit if you want. Um, yeah. So, and then they ask us why we don't have even operator overload in JavaScript. Like, really? Uh, where do we put it? And in the meanwhile, in native languages, all that they need to do for such a simple expression. Well, <laughs> you pass numbers, we just do some. And good engines need, in order to be fast, in order to have JavaScript speed at least somewhat close to native, we actually need to somehow go from this to just this. There's just lots of steps which we can't just drop away because they're important, you otherwise are not compliance engine and you're not executing JavaScript correctly. And I suggest that we look at how engines achieve that, how they can go and avoid almost all of these steps and make our functions really fast. First of all, let's take a look at what JavaScript representation can engine use internally. Uh, first, it's pretty simple. It's abstract syntax tree. At the very same stage, uh, like 40 kilometers away, two years ago I was talking about ASTs, and, and then bubble appeared. I hope that many people uh, try to at least look into how to write custom bubble plugins. At least I know people. Who knows what is AST? Okay. Yeah, perfect. That's what I expected. So yeah, basically AST is just a simple object that represents our code inside, like instead of a string in just structured manner that we can work with, that uh, shows like which syntactic elements we have, the children, and so on. This makes it really easy to use for linters because linter can just check some specific syntactic nodes that it cares about and like forbid them. One, it makes it easy to use for transpilers. Transpiler can just um, like find syntactic construction that is unsupported in our engine and transform it to another syntactic construction. And what is really nice about AST is that it transforms back like one to one. Like apart from the comment formatting, probably it pretty much resembles the original code. So visually, uh, this code is represented as like program. We have this variable declaration. Variable declaration is of type var, or we can have a let or const. Uh, Inside of variable declaration, we have this variable declarator because inside of one var, we can list many variables, right? And variable declarator as its children has this answer on the left and on the right expressions that it needs to assign. Then this expression is just binary exploration of multiplication, which has arguments like just literal six and literal seven. So as you see, it resembles original pretty closely and we can work with this we cannot use some ugly regular expression to try to parse our code. We can just use a structured representation. Uh, but the only problem with it is that it resembles original code too closely for optimizations. Well, let's take a look at simple loop. So we have this variable and we have while loop. So our program consists of this variable declaration that you saw previously. And on the right, you have while statement with condition as a children and actual body as a children. Uh, what if our guideline says that we, instead of while, uh, instead of y i equals zero, we want to do just a variable declaration at the top of our function and then separately assignment. There are style, gui style guides like that. Well, in that case, our AST transforms completely differently. We have separate variable declaration. We have separate expression statements that assigns this i to zero, and then we have our while loop. What if instead of while loop, we want to use do while? Our program still does just the same, but our AST again looks very differently. We have do while statement instead, which has first its body and then uh, its condition. Uh, and for, for this code, we might think, okay, it's more reasonable to use for loop, right? It's much more natural. And now AST looks completely differently because variable declaration was moved into the fourth statement and test is also part of the fourth statement and we have body as separate child. So the problem is that in all these cases we have different syntax, we write different code, but it works exactly the same, right? We don't really care about 
for optimization or for execution, we don't really care about how it looks in our code. We don't care what style guides has or what types of loops we use. We care only about the order in which it's executed. Uh, and this AST doesn't denote uh, the order. It just denotes the structure of the code itself. Like as you do in code folding, you just fold the separate sections of your code. So in for statement, we have these three sections. We have this uh, init, test, and update, right? Uh, let's add notion of order to it. So, we ha so now we have that, like, after beginning of program, we execute this variable declaration. After it, we go to binary expression, which tests uh, our i less than 10. Uh, binary expression then goes to the update expression. Update expression, after it's executed, it goes back to the test and over and over. Now that we know in which order our uh, statements are executed, we don't really care whether it was for while, do while, whatever. So we can completely remove that part. Now, still, our, we know how to execute our program. We don't care about syntactic details. And we have this order, like, by just links between the nodes. Uh, at this point, we already drop lots of unsignificant information, like we don't care if it was if, switch, while, do while, for, uh, even try, catch. It's all now denoted explicitly in our Linux between the nodes. So that's what engine does in order to just go from syntax to uh, something that it can execute. Uh, at, now, uh, the only problem that is left uh, is that uh, we still have these complex statements with children and so on, and we don't re really know how to execute them, and we don't want to know this. We don't want to describe rules for each of them, like how we need to go recursively. Well, as far as I know, the first version of JavaScript core, Apple's uh, WebKit JavaScript interpreter, actually did go through AST and executed it recursively. But uh, well, it's it's just a suboptimal. You have like too much overhead by going through this tree over and over. So instead, uh, let's replace this with some extremely simple statements. Variable declaration, well, variable is just part of syntax. It can be defined on the level of function. What we really care in the first case is that it just stores zero under something with name i. Right? Extremely simple uh, statement that has just constant arguments and returns some value. Binary expression, what it needs to do in this case, like if it has i less than 10. We load i, we compare it with 10, whether it's less than, uh, and then we go to different places depending on whether it was true or false. So we replace it that way. Oh. Yeah, so now after store, we load i, we check is less than, we do branching and go to different places. And finally, we have this update expression. Update expression is also a very complex operation, even though in code it looks just a shorthand. It looks pretty simple. But in fact, what it needs to do, it needs to load i, it needs to add i to, to that result 1, and it needs to store the result back. So we add this operation explicitly with order in which they need to be executed. Is it clear at this point? <laughs> So now we don't have any more trees. We don't have any information about our original syntax. But the benefit is that we have explicit order of execution that we can go through. And second is that every operation is very simple. It's like we can easily define them. They're minimal. We can describe everything in syntax with just that set of operation. And uh, another one is that everything is just a constant here. Like, every operation returns just a constant that we never reassign. We have just numbered constants uh, throughout our code. I guess if there are functional developers in the, uh, like here, then they should appreciate the idea. Everything is expression, everything is constant. It becomes extremely simple to optimize this form. Uh, and if you know that our i is not a global, so it's, it doesn't create like window.i, but we are executing in strict mode or like inside a function. 
then we can do what is called load store elimination, and we can replace all the load with store that comes to that point. It might sound complex, but so what we do first, we replace our load and store with just zero. We replace another one with just add, which is used. And like our graph becomes much more simple, but there's still one point in T2 where we don't know exactly uh, which value we need to use because it can come from two different places into this place. Uh, so it can, it can be either zero or it can be previous i plus one. Uh, in this block. So uh, what IBM engineers when developing this form for uh, compile optimization did, they just created functions that they called phony, like just bad function, functions that pretends to be such. But as you can't just write that in academic papers that they were writing, they made it just phi, because it's Greek letter, now you can write it in academic paper. It, it sounds nice. And they just replaced this uh, so the, the idea is that uh, they replace this load uh, operation with this fee function that the only thing it does is chooses which input to use depending on where it came from. So on the beginning of our block, we have this fee functions. We just ch choose which value to use at this point. And then everything is pretty simple. So look how far we went, like from our AST to just very simple set of instructions. and such form is extremely easy to work with. We have everything that we need to know about the program and we have it defined in extremely simple operations. Uh, and this form is called static single assignment. Why static? Because we don't reassign it. Why single? Well, because it appears only one in, once in the code. Uh, let's take a look at some more complex example to see what benefits it brings. So I just replaced 10 with a dot lens. I hope everything is simple at this point. So after our fee, now instead of just having 10, we load a, we load property lens from a, we still compare and do branching and so on. Everything else looks just the same. Instead of 10, we just have this load a and load property. Is it clear? Cool. Uh, what optimization can we do here? One optimization that, uh, like, how we can do any optimization. So now, instead of having this control flow graph, which just shows uh, which statement is executed after which, on just the same representation, like, without changing anything, we can just use different links, which instead show where value is used. Like, apart from just having order in which statements are executed, we just use where like dependencies are. So for example, is less than depends on our T2 and T4. So we have those arrows from T2 and T4. Uh, like branch depends only on T5 and so on. So now we denote only dependencies. Now that value dependencies are clear between all those, they are just constant. We know that they are never reassigned. We know exactly which value is used at which point. We can, for example, just change the order, just move out those load and load property. Semantically, doesn't, like, anything doesn't change. Statements are still executed in the right order, values are used from the same places, and so on. While uh, the code itself is, is still executed in just the same way. So what engine can do further, it can just move away this block completely to the beginning. This what is called loop invariant code motion. That's what engine does for you. So many people think that they need to manually like cache a.lens before the loop and then use it in their loop. Well, that's not true because engine can like, is smart enough to figure out itself that uh, anything inside of your loop doesn't depend on a lens. It doesn't change it. Well, it's free to move it out to make it cheaper because it's executed only once instead of over and over in each loop iteration. Uh, what other optimizations can be done? Another one is... Uh, that code elimination. I've seen many people who do benchmarks on like what exactly is faster, like is it for loop, is it while loop, and so on. People really love micro benchmarks for some reason. Uh, but if you know how it's represented internally, all that you see is T1 is zero, T2 is load A, and so on. And you see that really our return in the end of the function that is this implicit return undefined, 
right? If you don't have any other then, it, its value does not depend on any other value here. Engine does the same. It builds this value dependency graph, it checks all the links, it sees it return, doesn't depend on it. So now if you remove this notion of order, you have just all the separate blocks and your return undefined is just floating around. It doesn't depend on anything else. And what engine can do, it obviously can drop everything that is insignificant for our result. Yay, our function is extremely fast. And people are measuring, like putting different body into our loop. Uh, they put that on like JS perf, benchmarks and so on. But if you, are, like, if you are writing simple code enough that engine can figure out that ending value does not depend on it and you have no side effects in your function, it will just optimize it away. So your function will be like almost instant. And then people write another benchmark where they just change something insignificantly. Engine might be just not smart enough to figure out in that case that that code elimination can happen. And then they say, oh, okay, so four is much faster. Well, don't do micro benchmarks, yeah. Probably that's a good question after, okay, so that you could get a microphone, <laughs> if you don't mind. Um, another interesting optimization is global value numbering, for example. Like, people ask why, for example, math.po is slower than just a plus b multiplied by s plus b. So what engines do in this case, you still have this value dependencies on different parts which come to them all. So what they do, they, uh, use a simple hash function on each operation, which also uses it like hash of its arguments, uh, name of the function, so like t type of operation, and like constants. In this case, let's just use simple numbers. So for load operation, you, we just use hash of argument, like one or two, depending whether it's A or B. Then we will be using some of those hashes in hashes of add. So both add we get hash three, and multiplication gets hash four, uh, six. Sorry. Uh, so what engine does? It rehashes all, all these temporary statements. It figures out okay, those two have same hash, so they probably do the same. Adams. At this point, it just needs to execute two load operations, add them, and multiply just the same value over and over. Doesn't work that nicely with mass.po because in mass.po you still need to load global, load that function, check that function is actually power, execute it with one argument and another, and then go to the C end where it's probably executed. While w when you write it manually, it's just simple JavaScript that can be optimized away. Uh, so there's lots of other interesting optimizations that can be done in such form. Uh, but I guess I'll just stop here for now. And in the second part, we will talk about engines, what, how exactly they came to such representations and how it works. You can come here. Okay. Okay. Uh-huh. Uh -huh. <laughs> uh. Якою мовою мови повторяти? <laughs> Окей, коротше. Uh, питання в тому, якщо в нас в форлупі є сайд-ефекти. Щас. <laughs> Блін, на цій штуці було прикольніше. Коротше. Uh, На чомусь би намалювати було. Окей. 
Да, сейчас. Окей, то есть, давайте, у нас тут есть value dependency, да? Uh, engine trackает эти value dependency для оптимизации. Если у тебя посередине есть side effect, ну, або он не знает, что эта функция имеет side effect, то есть, он ее может або заинлайнить, и в тебе есть side effect, ну, она сразу знает, да? Заинлайнилась, оптимизуется, все круто. А вот это какая-то просто неведомая функция, он тогда по дефолту считает, что side effect там будет. Вот эти все лишние штуки навколо все равно оптимизуются. То есть, если твоя функция зависит от аргумента, от i, то она, ну, он ее не сможет оптимизировать. Если у тебя функция просто выкликается, то фига раз. Ну, он все равно выполняет ее просто столько раз, сколько нужно, но при этом он все равно может сделать этот loop invariant code motion. То есть, сайд эффекты останутся, но ну, все, что от них не зависит, нет. То есть, например, если ты рахуешь в одном цикле, там, допустим, сумму, и в этот же час, ну, сумму всех элементов, но и ты ее не вертаешь, и в этот же час выкликаешь еще какую-то левую функцию, то если левая функция останется, сумма пропадет. Как раз из-за того, что value dependency требуется. Да. Any other questions? <laughs> Seriously? <laughs> mm -hmm. Это, мабуть, до второй части относится. Ну, в целом. Оно не поможет. Вот. А, питание... Если мы добавим TypeScript или Flow э, в JS прямо нативно, то движкам это сильно поможет? Нет. <laughs> ну, это не поможет чисто из-за того, что... Черт. Ну, короче, я чуть-чуть забежу наперед. Э, это не поможет чисто из-за того, что в тебе все равно есть JIT, который должен компилировать сначала твою функцию. И компиляция, она штука дорога вообще. То есть реально показывали разные бенчмарки, где... Э, у тебя GCC, то есть просто сишный код, ты его компилируешь и дальше запускаешь, и вплоть до каких-то великих там, ну, чисел в цикле, допустим, то есть когда ты уже дофига раз повторяешь, у тебя выходит компиляция плюс выполнение, разом занимает все равно в GCC набагато больше времени, чем в V8, допустим. Чисто из-за того, что компиляция, она дорога, оптимизации, они дорогие, они занимают час, а первый экспириенс, он все равно должен быть с интерпретатором. Как раз из-за того, чтобы выполнять эти все эти все оптимизации, от которых не будет смысла, то что в тебе инициализация только один раз пройде. И из-за того, как раз эти все type annotations не допоможут, потому что ну, на этапе интерпретации ты не сильно паришься про типы. А до, пока оно доходит до, до этапа оптимизации, интерпретатор уже собрал достаточно э, типов для каждого аргумента функции и так далее. Он уже знает, с какими типами она выкладывалась, и он, ну, ему уже не нужно type annotations на этот момент. Он уже и так оптимизирует под конкретные типы. Int, int, float, float и так далее. It goes to interpreter. In interpreter we get a bytecode. It can be like stack machine, it can be just... Anyway, some low-level bytecode that is uh, just executed by huge switch case uh, in the loop. So we just check, okay, if this bytecode then we call it and so on. And interpreter in the meanwhile, while it executes your code just slowly, it collects uh, lots of type information that is useful for the optimizer. So it, then it goes to some simple JIT. Simple JIT generates uh, native code, but it's just not optimized yet. It didn't apply all these optimizations from the previous steps. And uh, then after your code hits enough, like it uh, is executed lots of times, it goes to the optimization algorithm, which takes much more time to uh, compile, but uh, it can produce much faster native code. Again, like there is nothing complicated in just generating native code for JavaScript, but it's really hard to generate optimized native code for JavaScript. Because like in simple uh, case, you just generate lots of calls to XNull function. It's native, yeah, but. So uh, let me just go through each engine and how, how they went. I will start with SpiderMonkey since it's just fast JavaScript engine which was written by Brandon Egg at uh, Netscape Communications. Uh, here's just link to build documentation like uh, so that you can download it and build the debug version of SpiderMonkey and play with the samples that I will be showing. Uh, so initially SpiderMonkey uh, generated just bytecode and Pretty much the same bytecode interpreter still exists nowadays, 20 years later. 
And in Spidey Monkey console, you can just run uh, JS. They have separate JS executable. So instead of browser, you can just generate it. You can just call this native executable. Uh, it's purely console. You can add your functions and so on. It's pretty much like node REPL. So, uh, and they have simple function Ds that you can use in this console, which shows you disassembly of your function in bytecode. So here for function add that we, will be, that we were using in previous uh, section, it shows that bytecode consists of like get argument zero, get argument one. They are now both on the stack, then add just takes them from the stack, adds, pushes back, return takes the last value, returns it, and uh, whatever it read error value does. Anyway, uh, I guess this is pretty easy to understand, right? Just some high level bytecode which has like no low level assembly, but at the same time it can be easily executed. And apart from the bytecode, uh, it also shows you flags that this function has. So in this case, it says that it can be constructor. Uh, Spider Monkey also has flags for like, is it arrow function, is it lambda, and so on and so on. And apart from that, it has source nodes. Source nodes uh, just say which uh, offset in your code lies at which line and column. Why are they doing this? Because uh, in Spider Monkey, like generally in JavaScript, you can do like function dot to string, right? And in Spider Monkey, they decide that they don't want to waste lots of memory on just having all the source codes, like your Angular, Amber, and whatever, in the memory. And then, apart from that, have your byte code, which pretty much resembles the original. So what they did, uh, they added those source nodes, which just have locations in the original code. And when you call function to string, instead of taking some like original source, it decompiles this bytecode by, back to string, like by just concatenating all these pieces and lines and columns and building this. Uh, well, that's a strange decision, but on the other hand, it allows them to save lots of memory that can't be saved, for example, in V8 or JavaScript core, because they actually save both representations. Uh, Another way you can see this disassembly is just to run this, uh, run your JavaScript with dump bytecode, and you can do like print timing, and it will just dump uh, bytecode for each function in your JavaScript. And y you will see sections like script, temp.js, seven, that means that function is at line seven in your temp.js, and here goes your bytecode, and that's it. So if you have some ready JavaScript that, and you want to see how it will become, uh, you can just run this console interpreter. Uh, but it was pretty slow and then like V8 appeared and they needed, uh, like V8 just generated native code, but unoptimized version of native code at that point. And they needed to compete with it. That's how browser was started on performance. So Mozilla, like at that point, uh, SpiderMonkey was uh, being maintained at Mozilla and Mozilla invented first JavaScript JIT. The idea is extremely simple. You have this normal interpretation, and if you execute something like more than two times, you go to the uh, trace execution phase. What trace execution does, it just, uh, sorry, you first go to the trace recording. So what trace recording does, it just records all the steps that you uh, execute in this loop that was executed at least two times. So it really just generates lots of native code for this loop. Okay, we save this huge blob uh, for the loop body. Then it goes to the trace optimization, where it just performs very simple like native level optimizations. And, and the next time you execute a loop, like for on the first time, it just reuses this same native code that it generated. So that native code assumes that whatever you did in your loop, you will have just the same types, you will have just the same order of execution, and so on. Whenever that fails, whenever you pass different types, it like says God failed and back, goes back to normal interpretation, drops away all the native code, and starts over. Uh, this is how it might look in uh, pseudo code. So if if I run this loop enough, our trace will just have like if loop ended, we leave this trace. Then we assign also operation if last operation of float, like we added two integers that didn't fit into a 32 bit integer. We leave this. If I plus one overflowed, we leave it. So generally, it's fast code, but the problem with it is that it leaves 
uh, the trace often enough. There's lots of condition under which all the native code will be dropped away. Anyway, at that point, it allowed them to get some really impressive speed up. It was uh, how JavaScript became fast at all. So on the benchmark, you can see that uh, on some benchmarks, it went like 20 times faster than just interpreter. And at that point, they could compete with V8 because such code was even somewhat faster than native and just loops. Uh, like nothing else is optimized, yet it works nice. Uh, then they figure that it is not enough, and Jackie Monkey appeared. I really love their logos. Um, the idea of Jackie Monkey is that uh, you just, instead of dropping trace away, look, in, in trace, when you execute your code, you can call other functions. It will just store them to the same long, long native code. You can go in, so in line it just comes naturally. The only problem is that when something failed, absolutely all the native code is dropped. All the inline function, everything. So what they decided to do in Jagamank is they decided to just save this native code at least within function. So if you drop in something, you are dropping not like entire code, you're dropping only the pieces, only the methods that failed. So if uh, you have some functions that are executed with different types. Those functions will go back to interpreter, while everything else will be still optimized. So they could uh, get back into the line of with other engines, which were optimized by that point. Uh, finally, in 2011, they added generic type inference, which just looks at operations and says, okay, if we have multiplications, then it's probably numbers. If you have I++, it's probably also number, and so on and so on. And they just dropped away trace monkey because fig they figured out that checker monkey plus generic type inference is already faster. We don't need trace monkey anymore. Now we're just skipping like a few years. So um, they in 2013 they added inline caching to interpreter. Inline caching is a technique that is used in many JIT. Its idea is actually very simple. So when you do this property access, generally like Java developers think that we have everything as a hash map. So whenever we do like property access, we look string in the entire map, like go through the tree and so on. It's very slow if you do that lots of times and you have lots of objects properties in your code. So inline caching instead does, okay, we have this get an element by ID. Is our document still the type of doc HTML document that we've seen before? If it is, then we just use the cached offset and we just take value directly. If not, we go the slow pass we figure out where exactly that uh, property with such name exists. Okay, we found it, we saved it in the cache. If some another type is uh, passed, so if in your function, like, you just do object.prop. If you pass every time, the same for object, offset preserves. If you pass another type, well, inline cache fails, it again goes to the slow pass, saves another offset. So it becomes much faster than looking up the same property over and over and over. And then this cached offset can be used for really just getting value from memory. Uh, so they just dropped Jackie Monkey because baseline plus this inline caching was good enough. It was slower than Jackie Monkey, but uh, on the positive side, inline cache uh, naturally just collects already type information, offsets, and so on, which can be used for even better optimization compiler. And at the same time, it's much, much simpler than optimizing these traces. So they just drop the old Chaggy monkey, and now their graph looks like this. They have this parse, generates bytecode. Bytecode, when it becomes hot, it goes to the baseline. Baseline passes all the type information and native code to the better optimization compiler. So this better optimization compiler is that they, uh, different order, sorry. So uh, for baseline, you can see uh, what exactly is happening by just passing those flags as environment variables in front of this being like, in front of JS executable. And it says you like which inline caches I used to, if I call the same function add, uh, the same examples that I showed previously, it's, uh, you can see that it says, uh, okay, I generated like less than for integers. It figured that it's integers only, it generated it. Then again, it created like new type monitors. Okay, figured out that add always is called with only integers. You can see that uh, generating add is like it generates native code only for integers and so on. And it has fallback hits for, it says fallback hits just in case your type changes. 
And you can debug it this way. In source code, some assumption failed. Oh, actually, line seven is fine. Sorry. So, uh, temp.js and seven or three, it's just like uh, where a function exists. But it says line 12. Line 12 is exactly where assumption failed. So where instead of like, I hit it, this function add with just integers, x and y, and then I passed object, then it says that at line 12, something weird happened. Extremely useful output. You get lines right away, not like in other engines, unfortunately. And it says like line four in the middle of x plus y. It's not integer anymore. And it says that exactly it was called from line 12. You know where exactly Bailin happened. You can fix it in your program. So uh, the lesson from this, if you want to do functions that operate, for example, one like on numbers and strings, just create two functions. If you want to make it really fast, create one function for one types, another function for another types. That's pretty much what you do if, if you write like a TypeScript or Flow. It just teaches you to write functions that are typed specifically for one uh, kind of values. Then it will be much faster because engine doesn't need to bail out anywhere. It's prohibited for anything. And finally, what uh, you can debug the CFG and SSA from. You can just pass iron flex logs, call your JavaScript binary with your JavaScript, and it creates TMP iron CFG and TMP iron JSON, which represent just this CFG and SSI. Uh, and you can visualize them. So if you're on Windows, then it generates them just in the root of the disk, whatever. Uh, you can use C1 visualizer. The CFG format is um, taken from Java Hotspot compiler, which was which, which inspired many engines uh, for CFG and SSA optimization. So they did this for Java. It worked well, well for other engines. They decided to just spit in the same format so that they, they could easily debug different steps of optimizations uh, like in their own engine while developing something. So you can see that on the left, probably you can't see, anyway. Uh, on the left, uh, there's a list of uh, optimization phases. You can see that there is uh, GVN, like global value number in that I showed, LICM, loop invariant code motion, and so on. So those should be familiar names for you. And at each stage, you could, you could see how exactly blocks are reformed. You can see which operation each block. Uh, you can see which operations are in each block. Uh, like it's add, knob, and so on. And you can see that they are numbered just like they were in SSA in the theoretical part. Uh, and another uh, visualizer is just web. If you don't want to use Java visualizer or you don't have Java or whatever, you can use web version, uh, either Hydra built by Vyacheslav Yehorov. And it also accepts just the same CFG format. You can hover different blocks. You can see which operation it exists, uh, it contains. and uh, for example, for the iteration part, you can see that we have constant one. We perform add from the i to one. Then we go to another block. So you have this control flow graph. We have all the SSA operations, which are just pure, pretty easy to debug. Is that clear? Sorry? Yeah. Well, generally, engines insert those knobs where they might insert something in the future. So in this case, it's just for probably breakpoint or whatever. Or they might insert just the optimization, or they might insert another optimization, optimized code in the middle of it. Let's talk about V8. I, like Everyone talks about V8. It's boring. I know. Sorry. So you can also download it and build. Uh, I can show you later in my lab how also four engines build. You, you can build the back version of it, or you can just use Node. So, uh, how V8 is internally, was fastly internally constructed. We have this source. It goes to the preparser. They have se separate preparser stage, which uh, only goes through the code and figures out like what are syntax errors. It reports them back to you, if there are any. Another thing that it does, it saves offsets for each function that it meets. Many people ask, uh, like, 
why there is this 600 character limit on inline functions. If you heard about it. Anyway. <laughs> so, uh, it's exactly because uh, V8 uh, does not really parse everything when it meets it. Instead, it just saves offset for each function. And then, at the next stage, when you execute some function, it goes to the parser, parser, parse, like parses to proper AST, AST goes to the full code again. Full code again just generates unoptimized native code with inline caches. It's being executed. When some assumption fails, it goes uh, back to parser, like reparses, and so on. So they don't even save this AST in the middle just because they don't want to waste too much memory. And also if some card, like if some assumption fails in the middle of execution, it also goes back to the parser. Or if you call external function that wasn't parsed yet, again, it's been parsed, compiled, that's it. Uh, but you saw like how spider monkey beats them with just very simple JIT that fails often. So they edit their own JIT, crankshaft. Uh, in crankshaft, pretty much the same is preserved, but when your function becomes hot enough, it goes to the optimizing compiler. Optimizing compiler generates control flow graph with all those SSA operations. Then you, uh, from this control flow graph, after you do all the dead code elimination, loop invariant code motion, whatever, it goes to the low level ER, uh, which just executes uh, various low level optimizations, but it's still machine independent. It looks like assembler, but it just doesn't rely on specific CPU features and so on. And then it generates to the optimized native code. So at the same time, some of your functions can be optimized uh, or not optimized, but anyway, they are all executed natively. When something bails out, it goes back to parser and it starts always with full code then. After full code then is executed, native function is executed m many times, it goes to the hydrogen yeah, and so on. So. This might look complex, but in fact, it's pretty easy, pretty simple implementation. If something failed, we start over. If it's hot enough, we go to the optimize stage. And they uh, managed to speed up Chrome like two times in different benchmarks uh, by having this uh, multi-tire uh, implementation. How you can debug it? Well, uh, I guess you don't really want to build V8 locally, especially if you have Node.js, and Node.js has this built in. So if you execute Node.js code and you want to, it to be fast, you can uh, dump different parts of optimizations. You can do this Node V8 options, grab whatever it can trace, and there's lots of options. Feel free to read the documentation. I'm not going to list all of them. Uh, one that you might, might be interested in is, again, bailouts. That's what we are really interested in because that's where any day optimization happens. That's where our code goes back to the interpreter and becomes slow. So again, on the same code example, uh, I'm executing node trace deopt and it logs to the console, to the STDR, uh, all the day optimizations that happen. Unfortunately, in this case, it's not uh, clear where exactly it happened. VA doesn't output lines. Uh, it just has some internal IDs and memory locations and so on. They optimize at 111, whatever that means. That's not useful. So instead what we can do, we can execute it with even more flags. Right. Always add another flag if information is not enough. And in that case, it uh, will generate two files, one of which is uh, the generated uh, native code, and another one is the CFG, control flow graph. Again, it's just the same format as was used in Java Hotspot or SpiderMonkey. You can also visualize it. You can see all the steps of optimizations. You can see how your code changed. So, and here it shows where exactly the optimization happened. It matches those files. So in this case, you can see that where, uh, that where it tried to get Y value as number, it deoptimized it de -optimized because it's not a number. Fair enough. Uh, okay. Now, another thing that they are working on <laughs> is interpreter. While other engines uh, had interpreter from the beginning, V8 uh, was just generating native code. And everyone was like, ooh, 
it generates native code right away. It's cool, it's fast, and so on. Unfortunately, one thing that they didn't take into account, probably, maybe they are smart guys and there was so, there were some other reasons. But anyway, uh, was mobile devices. Mobile web became extremely popular, and on mobile devices, you don't have that much memory to hold lots of unoptimized native code. So when you open the page, it starts consuming lots of memory to just compile your function to native, and page might just crash, just because you have lots of JavaScript. Uh, and this is one of the reasons why it doesn't work, for example, for React Native. It generates native code, yes, but it's lots of code. It just doesn't fit the memory constraints of your application. So JSC, for example, works better. So what they're working on is they're implementing a bytecode interpreter, just like in other engines, pretty high level. And the plan is that crankshaft, full code can, and so on can be all just removed away in favor of new optimizers that works on this bytecode. So if now you have this three-tire engine, the idea is that you will have only bytecode, and then it goes to the optimizers that can work with it. Uh, well, they are saying this for several years now, as someone from their team tweeted, like, uh, yeah, so we developed this new, uh, new compiler, Turbofan, just to reduce number of engines, but now we reduced it to five. Okay, <laughs> that happens. Let's talk about the next engine, JavaScript core. Well, the initial three-tire model uh, was pretty simple. So they have this interpreter, uh, which, if optimized enough, it goes to the baseline JIT. I if it calls too much times, it goes to the data flow graph JIT. There are two interesting things that, even it, if it looks the same, uh, they are different. First of all, uh, interpreter is very different. While in other, uh, with, while in other engines, uh, your interpreter works on stack machine, so it needs to, every time, like load and uh, pull values from the stack, which is somewhat uh, expensive. Uh, in LLint, they leave some gaps for the native code pieces. And instead of just having this while switch block, which chooses bytecodes, they just insert uh, like real native pieces for uh, each bytecode. Is it clear? Uh, and again, like when it gets hot, it goes to the baseline JIT. And then another thing that they did differently is the uh, optimizing JIT. So you can notice that it says DFG, not CFG. So DFG means data flow graph. So instead of operating on like control flow graph, they immediately operate on the like value dependencies. And they do that in continuation passing style. I didn't want to cover that in theory because it's pretty much the same as SSA, but the only difference is that it's more often met in functional languages. So in functional languages, you have uh, this continuation always passed as an argument, like what you, sh you need to do next. That's how functional compilers work, compilers for functional languages. Uh, to make it simple, imagine that in your JavaScript code, you just write everything with callbacks. Like you have one plus two, then callback, like save it, then call back load another value, and so on. So functionally, it's the same as SA because you have just constants, you have order of execution, and so on. It just works a bit differently. Uh, it looks a bit differently in the code. And so, so yeah, this DFG cheat inside parses the bytecode that was generated by the bytecode interpreter, or, uh, does type inference based on the types that interpreter saw in different places of code, inserts type checks, uh, performs this continuation passing style uh, optimizations, which are just the same as SSA optimizations, and then goes to the backend, which generates native code with all sorts of optimizations built in. And uh, you, as you can see, uh, this brings pretty good uh, speed up. So in LLint, the code is very slow. In baseline, it's about 10 times faster, but when it goes to the DFG, all the optimizations are applied. It just goes crazy. Uh, unfortunately, that wasn't enough because in CPS uh, is a continuation passing style. 
like you still can't enable, for example, loop invariant code motion, which I sh showed about. So you can't move out some values because you still have this order of execution. So what they decided is that they can reuse LLVM that is being used for C and Rust and so on. And at the point that they collected uh, types for all the places of code, you can just, you, you basically have like native code, you know all the types, you can just pass it to LLVM and LLVM is already good at optimizing native code. So it looks just as native, it, like LLVM doesn't care where it came from and it can do lots of optimizations just for you instead of you doing that manually. And so yeah, model becomes you parse JavaScript function, uh, you interpret it, you collect types, compile with baseline. Then at some point, if it's hot enough, you asynchronously call uh, the DFG compiler in separate thread. After it's compiled, it replaces your function right in the middle uh, of execution. Then if it, get, it gets hot enough, like more than 1,000 times, then it goes even to LLVM, which is much, much slower, but brings even better optimizations. And then asynchronously, again, replaces your code with even a more optimized one. Again, that brought pretty nice speed up. And finally, how you can dump different code. Unfortunately, I didn't find an option to find bailouts. You can only do like verbose compilation in which uh, it just generates you tons of tons of logs and say you can find some bailouts in the middle. Uh, but at least you can dump DFG. Again, unfortunately, they didn't use this de facto standard CFG format. So DFG looks like this. You have just lots of weird characters. But in, gen in general, you can find out that it's pretty similar. You have also operations. You have these numbers for temporary values. And you can see which types were used, uh, which dependencies it has. For example, movehint uses value 3, like JS constant, and so on. So it's much more verbose. It's, unfortunately, it's not visualized yet. But you can debug at least and see like what has been done on your code, what has been optimized, what not. Finally, there is Chakra Core. Chakra Core is open sourced relatively recently. Uh, it existed like since IE9, but uh, unfortunately there is not that much documentation on the internal structure, how it works. Anyway, this graph shows that it works in pretty much the same way as any other engine. The only difference that you can see is that it creates additional threads for JIT. So yeah, for example, as JavaScript or, or any other engine. But the bonus is that it can generate threads for every function that you execute. If you see that there are three uh, cores on your CPU, it can just parallelize the compilation of different functions at the same time. Whichever comes first, it just replaces native code. Another function can okay, replace in different place. So uh, it uses your CPU as much as possible to speed up your code even better. If you see, for example, that it process monitor, it's just for some reason extremely hot compared to V8, you know at least why. It just tries better. Uh, and another interesting thing that they implemented is that on the bailout, they don't de-optimize completely. So if you call this function like add with like thousand times with just numbers, and then once you pass like string or object, it goes back to the interpreter, but it doesn't throw nat uh, native code away. It executes this piece like in the interpreter slowly, but it gives you a chance to rehabilitate and like in the future, if you just pass numbers again, it will just reuse the same native code. So instead of dropping it right away, it just has some threshold on how many times you can do something bad with your function. So because of that, I couldn't make it bail out with our simple exemption example, because it's simply, okay, I'll execute it in interpretation mode. It's not bailout yet. So I had to make a different function, which is slightly more complex, like uh, just absolute value, which has like if, return, and so on, so it's fine. And uh, at some point, like instead of number, I just pass it to string. Then uh, you can execute this chakra executable with trace bailout with your JavaScript. And it will say bailout function apps and kind bailout int only. So it says there were always integers. You are passing me some crap. And 
if, if, you, if I would pass like float values, it would say bailout number only, generic number. I guess that's pretty much it. Another thing that it, you can do is, again, dump CFG plus SSA. Again, it doesn't generate this CFG format, which is nice to visualize, but uh, instead it at least inserts pieces of your original code and you can see where exactly each block is. So here it says that like return minus X, you see that the statement boundary, negate, right, and break this function. That's it. Uh, you can visit rvfastyet.com to see how different engines compete uh, over time and how they uh, optimize. Like, uh, and you can see that at the moment, the new V8 optimizes much faster than everything else, except it can be called only on certain kinds of functions, for example, asm.js and so on. So it works well only if you have really lots of type information. The plan is to replace completely. We will see how it goes. I wanted to insert graphs here, but unfortunately participants started to post different photos and Wi-Fi has ended. But you can visit it in your browser. And we did it. I didn't cover, unfortunately, many parts like uh, garbage collection, which can be awfully, often your bottleneck instead of like native level optimizations if you create lots of objects. Uh, like I didn't cover how you can load per path by code and so on but I hope it was interesting enough. Thank you. With what? Well, as you can see, it was. <laughs> um, that's a very good question. Well, generally, it could be optimized the way probably just optimized is not uh, good enough to figure this out in this particular case. No, really, it could optimize it uh, because you are not saving it to any variable, which could be global. Like, if you were saving it to variable, you can access it through, like, window.x, whatever, it can't optimize it. In this case, it could, but just didn't. <laughs> just probably not good enough. <laughs> Boring. <laughs> Пиши код согласно без практикам. Все оптимизируется классно. <laughs> ну, вообще довольно часто. <laughs> Не, ну смотри, вообще у нас в компании я сейчас пишу в основном на C. <laughs> я не JavaScript разработчик, да. Но на самом деле... Приходится иногда работать с JavaScript кодом. В частности, ну это не NDA, в принципе. Короче, иногда я генерирую C с помощью JavaScript. Только потому, что ну, некоторые вещи удобнее генерировать, чем, э, чем писать вручную. Особенно, когда ты работаешь с парсингом, а я в основном работаю с ним. Парсинг, трансформация и так дальше. Проще сгенерировать с грамматики какой-то готовый кусок нативного кода. Он дальше компилируется, он быстрый. Все супер. Я не хочу все это писать вручную. Вот. Ну, а в общем, э, у тебя бывают разные интересные моменты. Вот сейчас почему я открыл твиттер. Я не знаю, видели ли вы этот твит. Но бывают странные моменты, когда как бы хочется быстрого парсинга, но ты не понимаешь, в чем вообще затык у тебя в коде. И в частности, в этом примере э, затык был как раз в инлайнинге, в, в, в V8. Извините, сложно по-русски. Окей, я на украинском. Короче, вы видим на это мое цей препарсер, дальше парсер. Поки функция не скомпилировалась, он использует чисто препарсер, и зато для инлайнинга он не знает, насколько складна твоя функция в середине. 
І оскільки він цього не знає, все, що він може заюзати, це якраз офсети в оригінальному коді. Окей, офсет звідси, дивіться, в нас типу функція. Дивимося, вона менше, ніж 600 символів. Окей, якщо менше, ми можемо її заінлайнити. Ну і, коротше, в цьому випадку ти просто спідап в майже два рази вийшов чисто із-за того, що я просто, ну, вже нема куди функцію зменшувати. Я поміняв пробіли на таби, кожні чотири пробіли помінялись на один таб. Функція стала менше, ніж 600 символів, два рази швидкість переросла в цілому по парсеру. Тобто, да, дебажити приходиться. Спасибо.